Hey loyal fans, you should know my goal in these videos is to contribute to your personal intellectual toolkit. In this video, I describe science and explain the difference between science and pseudoscience. I chose this topic because most people don't understand science. A dictionary will tell you science is knowledge, but that's wrong. It's what people think science means, and that's a dictionary's intended purpose, to describe what people think words mean. But science has a higher meaning, unknown to most people. I'm going to tell you what it is. So let's get started. To describe science, we should first explain its origins. Before modern science, people were told what to think by authority figures, mostly religious, and were not allowed to think independently. Those who thought for themselves were accused of heresy, punished, and sometimes killed. Giordano Bruno was an original thinker who lived in a time when original ideas were dangerous. Bruno's ideas were far ahead of his time. He thought stars were distant suns with planets of their own, an idea that was only proven in 1995, 400 years after Bruno's time. He also thought the universe was infinite and had no center, which happens to be a key thesis of modern cosmology. Unfortunately for Bruno, his ideas weren't in the Bible, so he was tried and convicted of heresy, then he was tied to a post and set on fire. No, boys and girls, I'm not making this up. Galileo Galilei's importance to science cannot be overemphasized. He relied on experiments to validate or refute his own theories. He was a careful observer and an original thinker. Galileo designed one of the first practical telescopes and began observing the planets. He saw that Jupiter had four traveling companions, small nearby points of light that appeared to orbit the main body. Being a free thinker, Galileo realized that Jupiter and its orbiting companions might serve as a model for the solar system. He considered the idea that the Earth might orbit the Sun, contrary to the prevailing idea that the Sun orbited the Earth. To those who might wonder why anyone would care which it was, consider the perspective of the Church. To the authorities, the center of the solar system was the Earth. The center of the Earth was Rome, and the center of Rome was the Church. In Galileo's new model, the Earth was just one of several planets orbiting the Sun, thus demoting the Earth and the Church to mere wanderers. So, the Church arrested Galileo, forced him to publicly recant his heretical ideas, then subjected him to a lifetime of house arrest. But they didn't set him on fire. The reason was the Church could no longer do that. They were quickly losing ground in an intellectual revolution now called the Enlightenment. The British Royal Society was founded only a few decades after Galileo's time. The Society's motto concisely expresses two principles of science, rejection of authority and a focus on observation and evidence. It's important to say that science's rejection of authority extends to scientists themselves in order to avoid the creation of a science priest class. This is an ongoing struggle against a deplorable elevation of personalities over principles. Apart from his original work in theoretical physics, Richard Feynman was an excellent teacher who instinctively disliked and rejected authority, including his own. Feynman often spoke out against examples of weak science and pseudoscience, and often reminded his students of the importance of experimental validation. Professor Feynman. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. In that simple statement, is the key to science. It doesn't make any difference how beautiful your guess is, it doesn't make any difference how smart you are who made the guess, or what his name is. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. That's all there is to it. Because authority contradicts scientific principles, the rejection of authority and expertise cannot be overemphasized. Science is about theories and evidence, nothing else. A theory must agree with evidence, and evidence must eventually find an explaining theory. I like saying it this way, the greatest amount of scientific eminence is trumped by the smallest amount of scientific evidence. In this section, I explain what science requires, what makes science science, and some of the ways science goes wrong. I explain the demarcation between science and pseudoscience and how they differ. 
Among other things, science is an interplay between theory and evidence. Both are required. Sometimes evidence leads to a theory, sometimes the reverse, sometimes theory and evidence evolve together. The highest quality theories are expressed using mathematics, for many reasons including clarity and unambiguous predictions about nature. These theories stand in contrast to vaguely expressed ideas that can explain everything, which unfortunately means they can't explain anything. A scientific theory is an explanation, an intellectual framework that explains observational evidence and hopefully makes new predictions for phenomena not yet observed. Empirical evidence is a description and must refer to the natural world. Here's an example. If I say the night sky is filled with tiny points of light, that's a description, evidence. If instead I say those points of light are distant thermonuclear furnaces like our sun, that's an explanation, a theory. Scientific theories must be falsifiable, which means they must be compared to nature, and if the tests fail, the theory must be abandoned. To test the points of light theory, we could build a fusion reactor and see if it behaves like the sun and the stars. That means the theory is open to falsification. The null hypothesis requires us to assume a theory is false and let positive evidence contradict that assumption. To see the reason, imagine doing the opposite. Suppose we assume that Bigfoot is real and wait for evidence that he doesn't exist. That would require proof of a negative, often an impossible burden. So we must always assume our theories are false and allow that assumption to be contradicted by evidence. Skepticism is essential to science. Let me provide an example. A credulous observer says, I just saw a UFO that was as bright as Venus. The skeptic replies, Maybe it was as bright as Venus because it was Venus. Science deals with empirical reality, so scientific evidence must come from nature. This means science can't address spiritual or supernatural questions. On that topic, if anyone tries to tell you science can disprove God's existence, they don't know what they're talking about. Science can neither prove nor disprove God's existence. Science and spirituality are separate, non-intersecting domains. Science requires both theory and evidence. The reason is, a theory without evidence can make any claim. It can't be compared to nature or be falsified. And, evidence without a theory, without an explanation, is not science, because that would make everything science, which would make nothing science. Falsifiability is a key element of science. If a theory cannot be potentially falsified, then it either makes vague claims, or its claims cannot be compared to nature. Either one makes the theory unscientific. David Hume said, No amount of observations of white swans can allow the inference that all swans are white, but the observation of a single black swan is sufficient to refute that conclusion. This is one of my favorite science quotes. It explains why a theory can only be disproven, not proven. There are any number of examples in science where disproof of an existing theory led to a breakthrough, a new theory or understanding of nature. The null hypothesis is an essential part of experimental design. One must begin by assuming a theory is false and requires supporting evidence. Pseudoscience takes the opposite position. It assumes a theory is true and demands disproving evidence. Let's take Bigfoot as an example. You know, the hairy supernatural creature hiding in the woods. To a scientist, Bigfoot is false until one is located. To a pseudoscientist, Bigfoot is true until someone can disprove his existence. But disproving Bigfoot would require proof of a negative, an impossible task. So for the pseudoscientist, Bigfoot becomes real without any evidence. Consistent with the requirement for skepticism, Science assumes ideas are false, tries to disprove them, and seeks falsifying evidence. Pseudoscience assumes ideas are true, tries to prove them, and only seeks confirming evidence. You cannot reason people out of a position that they did not reason themselves into. This is another one of my favorite science quotations. It aptly describes a problem faced by skeptics and scientists. Now we'll examine scientific and pseudoscientific fields, using a rainbow to represent a spectrum of sciences, 
extending from very scientific to very unscientific. This science spectrum is consistent with a widely accepted consensus on the ranking of scientific and pseudoscientific fields. It extends from physics, which is perceived as a model of science, to astrology, a classic pseudoscience. Physics is a model science. Its theories are expressed as mathematical equations. Its experiments often show numerical agreement with theory to 10 decimal places. And best of all, when physicists don't know something, they tell you. Orbital dynamics? No problem. Just tell me where you want that spacecraft to touch down on Mars. But as to dark matter, no idea so far. And dark energy? Check with me later. Another way to say this is physicists know what they don't know to a degree not seen in many other sciences. Chemistry evolved from a medieval practice called alchemy, a plan to turn base metals into gold. But to become a science, chemistry had to abandon magical thinking, so no instant gold. But scientific chemistry is pretty powerful. Want a better cell phone battery? Ask a chemist. Biology moves away from the mathematical purity of physics and chemistry to study living things and their evolution, which is a more chaotic, less certain process. So some may regard biology as less scientific than chemistry or physics. Astrology has theories, but they fail empirical tests, so astrology is a classic failed science. It remains popular with people who don't understand science or who don't care. In the spectrum of science, astrology was replaced by astronomy. Let's focus now on psychology, the study of mind and behavior, a field whose practitioners believe constitutes science. Psychology has plenty of observations, but no falsifiable theories. The reason is the mind is not part of nature and is not accessible to unambiguous empirical observation. Professor Feynman. A hates his mother. The reason is, of course, because she didn't caress him or love him enough uh, when he was a child. Actually, if you investigate, you find out that it's a matter of fact, she, he did love him very much and everything was all right. Well, then, it's because she was overindulgent when he was there. <laughs> so by having a vague theory, <laughs> it's possible to get either result. <laughs> now, wait. Now, the cure for this one is the following. It would be possible to say, if it were possible to state ahead of time, how much love is not enough and how much love is overindulgent exactly, and then there would be a perfectly legitimate theory against which you can make tests. It is usually said when this is pointed out, how much love is and so on, oh, you're dealing with psychological matters and things can't be defined so precisely. Yes, but then you can't claim to know anything about it. <laughs> but psychology's problems are temporary. Just as chemistry replaced alchemy, neuroscience will replace psychology. Here's Neil deGrasse Tyson on this topic. Our best hope today lies with the neuroscientists. What are thoughts but electrical impulses among brain cells? What are ideas but novel firings of those cells? What are mental problems, if not impulses, that have misfired? In the way that chemistry arose from the ashes of alchemy, neuroscience, a field still in its infancy, may one day subsume psychology, laying bare our inner universe, which has remained hidden for so long. Here's an example of pseudoscience that everyone will understand. Let's say I'm a phony doctor who thinks he has a cure for the common cold. My cure is to shake dried gourds over the cold sufferer until symptoms abate. Here's the evidence in favor of my miracle cure. It might take a week, but it always works. It's been successfully replicated in other laboratories. It can be described in detail, the size of the gourds, the rhythm of the shakes, all the details. Here are the things I chose to ignore. I don't know why it works. I haven't set up a control group for comparison, one that gets a different treatment or no treatment. I haven't been skeptical and considered alternative explanations for the cure. So, I cured the common cold. Where's my Nobel Prize? Now think. If this were presented as a medical treatment, it would be rejected and the practitioners would be prosecuted. If instead this were presented as a psychological treatment, 
it would be immediately accepted and put into practice. No, boys and girls, I'm not kidding. I want to close on a positive note. There are many admirable ideas and people that should give us all reason to be optimistic about the future of science. Environmental activist Greta Thunberg was recently awarded a million euro prize, which she immediately donated to climate and environmental causes. I am submitting this report as my testimony because I don't want you to listen to me. I want you to listen to the scientists. And I want you to put, unite behind the science. And then I want you to take real action. Godspeed, Greta. Godspeed. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe.